Um, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was in the sixth grade, my dad's cousin got married, and this was uh, somewhat of a distant relative to, to me. Uh, my family didn't really spend a lot of time with her, so we barely knew my dad's cousin, who was the bride who was getting married, and we never met the groom or anything before uh, because they are from the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. And I grew up in the Houston area in Katy, Texas. So what happened is, is that when I was in sixth grade, we drove up to the wedding and we get there early. And of course, we're just in our traveling clothes. So we go into the, the bathroom of the church and we're changing into our tuxedo. So it's me and my brothers and my dad. And as we're doing so, we're getting on our suits, getting ready for this wedding. And then in comes a young man wearing a tuxedo and he's looking kind of nervous and he, he comes in and surprised to see so many strangers in this bathroom and he doesn't quite know what to say and he's kind of nervous anyway. And my dad breaks the awkwardness and says, we were uh, driving by and we saw a bunch of cars at a church on a Saturday and we figured it must be a funeral or a wedding, but either way, there's going to be some good food. <laughs> and this guy says, well, it's a wedding. My dad says, who's getting married? I am. Well, congratulations. And so this guy seemed kind of, didn't know what to do, didn't know what to say from that, and so then left. And uh, well, we were there at the wedding, and he was kind of looking at us. We were all in this, you know, there for the wedding. And then uh, if that wasn't bad enough, after the wedding, when it came time for family photos, that, uh, you know, now we got to bring in some of the extended family, and so me and my brothers and my dad were right next to him, just in the family photo. So now we're completely memorialized, and uh, he, this groom, didn't quite know what to do, and he went up to one of my aunts and said, I think these people are not supposed to be here, and they're in the family photos. And... My aunt had to let him know that, no, that's the edges for you, and that, uh, unfortunately, now you're related to him. And <laughs> so it, it goes to show that for a wedding like this, we have some conventional rules, societal standards, that you can be invited to a wedding. Now, of course, you can decline for polite reasons or whatever, but you can always reject, you can always say no, but... Uh, to crash a wedding, it's not really something you really can do or that you should do. It's just not even allowed in our society, much less so back in the ancient world where communities were a lot smaller and they had a, even more strict rules uh, on this. Jesus compares this heavenly banquet, he compares his kingdom to this uh, wedding banquet. So this is now a banquet, a time that uh, this master is going to prepare a feast, and he invites his close friends. But unfortunately, those original ones all say no. And so now this master goes out, and he invites really kind of anyone else. And that's going to lead us into our text for today. And then what I want us to do, then we'll look at the context and the fullness of this parable, uh, and then we'll see what Jesus is trying to say, because especially at the end uh, admittedly, it does get a, a little uh, confusing, but I think we can be able to understand Jesus clearly on this. So uh, let's read this together, Matthew 22, verse 8 and 9. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask that each one of us can know that um, not only do we have an invitation into your banquet, but that you're the one who also makes us worthy to enter it. You're the one who also clothes us in your righteousness. 
Lord, we ask that we can have assurance for anyone here who's struggling with the assurance of your goodness and your faithfulness to your word, that they can have this and know that you indeed keep your promises. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our God. Amen. So the way that this parable starts off, so we're in Matthew chapter 22. Last week we looked at another parable in Matthew 21. And uh, here Jesus is in Jerusalem. He is only days away from the cross. And now is his time to uh, really talk about really the Pharisees and those that God has entrusted to Israel. So now he is there in Jerusalem and he gets to speak in very honest and confrontational ways about how the leaders of Israel, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, Sadducees, how is it that they have led God's people? And what we're going to see is that last week that they were the ones that chose to not only only reject God, but also to uh, kill his son not to mention the other servants, and that because they did that, now the kingdom of God has been taken away from them. Today, we're looking at uh, maybe the same message, but put into a different parable here. And so here, it's not so much that it will be taken from them, but that they are the ones who are continuing to reject God and reject his invitation. So Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. So we have a master. He has this this king who's going to um, give a wedding feast for the son. And so uh, who is the son? Well, the son is Jesus and that we are his bride. So notice that. Uh, You see this in Revelation 21 as well, among other places, that the kingdom of God is really a wedding feast where we get the uh, union between Christ and his bride, and we get to participate and we get to celebrate within this. So he gives the invitation, but they would not come. Uh, So he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves and I've slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Uh, So if this is not enough, that this king sends other servants, other prophets, so it's not just one prophet once, but instead God throughout the Old Testament for hundreds of years has sent prophet after prophet. Some repented and came to faith. Others just continued to reject God. And so um, not only is this maybe a threat, but look at what you're missing. Look at everything that this king has done, that this feast has has already been prepared. What is he going to do with all of this leftover food and no one to celebrate uh, the wedding of his son with? But they paid no attention and went off one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. The, those who were rejecting God are not just anyone, but also remember that Jesus is speaking not only to anyone in Jerusalem, but to the leaders. So I think we can start off that this is about the chief priests, the leaders, those who were high up, uh, the teachers of the law. They were the ones who God has entrusted, and not only did they reject God, but that they have also uh, now killed his servants. And what do you think? this king is going to do. And so this king offers judgment against them. And then he said to the servants, uh, the wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out to the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. 
In that place there will, will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So we have here this wedding feast, again, that this king is ready and he has this entire feast uh, that is ready. And it begins with the rejection of those who were originally invited. And I think what we can learn from this is that first off, this master, this king wants everyone invited. Like he does invite everyone, right? Everyone is invited to this. He does not discriminate. At first, it's maybe for certain people. And we know that in salvation, that at first we have the kingdom of Israel. They were the ones who got to hear God's commandments first. They were the ones who got to hear the gospel first, the promise of this Messiah. They were the ones who had King David, uh, who wrote the Psalms that all prophesied about this Messiah. And so they had this treasure. They were the ones who had the sacrifice the promise of the forgiveness of sins, the inheritance. So Israel had this. However, though, they rejected time and time again, not all, but time and time again, many did. And so now God, this king, is going to say, fine, if they're going to reject me, then we can go out to the Gentiles. We can go out to those that uh, might not seem worthy, those that... Um, obviously God loves, but that now he's going to go out to the ends of the earth and gather as many as you possibly can find. We know this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of Jesus as their Savior. So God actually not just wants everyone saved, but he wants them to come through Christ. So the master in, invites everyone, and he wants everyone into this um, in, into this wedding feast. I think, second, Jesus is saying this. You can reject, but you cannot invite yourself. That, you know, just as my family, well, pretended to crash this wedding, that uh, in a smaller community, and, and you can see here that uh, this king does not really play around with people who just show up that this is something that you can certainly reject, but it's not that, hey, I'm going to go in, and if I'm going to sneak through the back door, or if I'm going to come in here, that I'm just going to, you know, declare myself. No, that, that, that's not really how this parable works, and that's not how our salvation works. Some people might say, well, it, it sounds like when it comes to our, our faith, don't we have, you know, decisions to make and, and so forth? Then in a way, yes, that we are the ones who are responsible for our salvation to a degree. That is that the faith that God has given you, uh, it is your responsibility, if you will, to continue to nurture that faith. And, and the community, the church, myself, your baptism sponsors, your parents, have the, uh, they have the, the privilege and the responsibility to keep you in this faith. However, though, um, you are not someone that can just simply go to God uh, as if we have the ability, as if we have the strength to go to God and declare to him anything, that instead we are uh, unable to do that. In Luther's small catechism in the third article of the creed, which is about the Holy Spirit, we see that we cannot by our own strength, our reason, come to Jesus Christ as my Lord, but we have that is through the gospel, through the Holy Spirit, that he has called us, he has enlightened us, and he has brought us to the salvation. So we have to understand when it comes to our salvation that it is the Holy Spirit that brings us to this. And so while we do have some responsibilities, at the same time, we put the credit and we give thanks to God for this. So you can reject, but you can't just show up going into God's kingdom as if you own the place, okay? You can't do that, but you can't say no. Now, what about this thing about being chosen, though? And I especially here, I'll go back a couple of verses. And this is admittedly one of these parables that as I was reading it this week, I'm going, oh, this is good. This is good. The next verse, oh, this is even better. Next verse, I got my sermon. I got it down. And then we get to verse 11 and we go, 
maybe we don't read verse 11, you know? What did, what did anyone notice? If we just skip over it, can we hop over it? And I thought, well, obviously that's not fair to Jesus. Uh, so what in the world is happening here? So the king sees this wedding guest, and there's a guy who had no wedding garment. Now, we got to understand, why does he not have a wedding garment? Well, I don't really know why he doesn't have one, but I do know that he should if he was properly invited, if he was someone who came in, and if he was a part of the celebration, what you would do is that when you came into the wedding feast to indicate that you're part of this family, that you're part of uh, a guest, that you are invited, then you would receive a kind of garment that would go over. So it'll be pretty obvious if you have it or if you don't have it. And so again, this is something when you have the proper invitation, you're properly invited, you come in, and you can receive this. So in this case, why there's a guy in here without it, I, I don't know. I almost get the impression maybe he snuck in, maybe he had it, then he took it off. Maybe it could have been that. In the parable, we don't quite see this. But at the very least, he's without the wedding garment. And uh, so the king says, well, friend, why don't you have a wedding garment? And, and he's speechless. And the king says to the attendants, bind them hand and foot and cast them out into outer darkness. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. I don't think we want to take this uh, to a, a place to make it seem that even if you think you're invited to the party and to the wedding celebration, that God's just going to kind of go around and, you know, arbitrarily, just indiscriminately say, okay, you're chosen, you're not. No, I think maybe it's at the very least uh, two things that come to my mind from what I can tell in the culture. One is that this person was not invited, so they snuck in. Um, and that's why they don't have the wedding garment. Well, again, you can reject, but you cannot just show up and make demands that you, you know, have a seat at the table or anything. Um, or maybe it was the case that maybe he was invited, maybe he came in, but for whatever reason, he rejected the wedding garment. Now, why you do that, I'm not exactly sure, but what is it about this garment? What, what do we hear about, and why are we talking about a kind of garment that will indicate that you have been clothed or covered uh, within this uh, family crest or within this family symbol to indicate that you are a part of this celebration. Well, we see this in Galatians 3, verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So that's the garment here. The garment is not simply that you can sneak in or that, yes, even if you come in and, and maybe you receive this, but that you can reject God. You can take it off. You can leave the celebration. But what is it that you cannot do? You cannot have this garment put upon yourself. You can't steal it. You can't demand it that it's only something given to you, but here's the thing, is that God does give this to you in your baptism. That we see this, uh, it is through faith that you are saved, but one way, the main way that God offers this salvation is that when you are baptized into Christ Jesus, that you have clothed yourselves with Christ. This is something that we say at the funeral service. So I know that our congregation has had some funerals uh, this uh, recently, uh, I mean, not, not, not here, but uh, others in our congregation have known people who passed away. And within the Christian burial service, that this is quoted at the beginning, as you can drape the pall, which is that white cloth that goes over the casket. Now, why is it white? Because of the purity that we are given in Christ Jesus. This garment that you are clothed with is white, because in the book of Revelation, we see that those who are around Christ, so this is this banquet, this wedding celebration, uh, as we are reconciled to Christ, our groom, and we get to celebrate this, what do we receive? We receive white robes. We see those that are praising Jesus with Jesus, the lamb who was slain, has begun his reign. 
He is there in the middle, and they are singing hallelujah to him, and that the saints have their robes that have been made white. How have they been made white? They've been made white by dipping their robes in the blood of Christ. So it's through the stain of the blood of Christ, by dipping their robes into the blood of Christ, now their robes get to be made white. So this is found in the book of Revelation in chapter 7, chapter 13, 14. Uh, chapter 21 continues this banquet reference. And so you can see here that this imagery is consistent with the New Testament. It's consistent with uh, what Jesus revealed to John in the book of Revelation, that when we are baptized, that we have been clothed with Christ. So again, just notice again here that um, when it comes to our salvation, that we can reject him, but we cannot really go to this banquet, demand that we ought to be on the list, demand that we ought to come in, because notice the grace that has to be given to us on this. You have to be invited. When you show up, you have to be clothed with this wedding garment to indicate that you properly belong there and that this is something uh, that would unify you with the west, rest of the wedding party that this is what Jesus offers you. And so when we think about God's grace within this, we don't want to take it to mean that even if you think you're part of this celebration, that God can still reject you. But really, I see it as the complete opposite on this. We see God's grace from time to time that he not only calls you, he invites you, he clothes you, and he's the one who gives you this wedding garment. Now, it's true that there are others and maybe those that are very close to you that have rejected the invitation. But it's not too late for them that this king, remember, he wants all invited, that that invitation uh, has not expired yet. As long as you have today, that you can still repent, you can still believe, you can still come to Christ. And so, friends, today, as we look at this, I want you to know that Christ is the one who is holding his hands out to you. He's the one who is inviting you to come into his feast. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're going to go now to our offering. And so uh, as we have our time of offering that the ushers are going to be coming forward.